Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Today, uh, I'd like to share a story about dealing with the future of Swift. Before talking about the future, we briefly have to look into the past. And in this past, Swift was brand new, and we started writing everything in it, and it was awesome. But at the same time, we didn't really know about all the things in the language, why they were the way they were, and also we didn't really know the direction that the language was going to. And that all changed, of course, last December, when Swift became open source. And as our eyes adjust to the brightness, as we get, get used to the, to the new situation we find ourselves in, we see the future of Swift. Because never in the history of Swift have we been able to look this far in the future of Swift. Figures. Um, and because we know what's coming for Swift, we also know what we don't have right now. Because we know what, what all is coming in Swift 3 in the fall, we also know what we're missing out now. And that reminded me of a great song by Johnny Nash. I can see clearly now where Swift will go. I can see all the obstacles in my way, but in the end, it's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. Great. We could sing it together. So this is the challenge. It, it's not a complete new challenge, per se. We've been doing it for a while. Remember box? Not too long ago, we, we had to box things when we wanted generic enums. And remember the feeling after WWDC every year when you know what the next version of Swift will bring, but then you'll be stuck with the old version for half a year? So it's not a new challenge per se, but it's not just one time a year. It's not just one feature. We have to do it all the time. Plan for the future, but live in the present. So this is the challenge when you're writing apps, but also when you're writing a framework. And that's the perspective um, that I want to talk from uh, today. So I wrote this, this framework called Bright Futures. And it's an implementation in Swift of the future concept. And the futures are a, a concept that allow you to write great asynchronous code. And of course, I want to know what the future versions of Swift will bring for asynchronous programming. So Swift went open source. And then there was this on the list. Out of scope for Swift 3 is concurrency. And concurrency is something you need to be able to, to do good asynchronous programming in the language. And this is, I thought, this is a good and a bad thing. So in, in, at least they, they think it's important, important enough to mention on the list. But it also means that, that we won't, it won't be relevant for the, the next half a year. So this is, this is what I'll have to do right now. Um, so what I'm trying to do is two things. I try to make the best future implementation for the current version of Swift. And I'd like to plan for how I would like to see futures in Swift four or five. And these are the two things that I'd like to talk to you um, about today. But first, let's, let's look at how Swift does asynchronous programming without any help from any third party libraries. And I bet that 99% that of your apps will have a line like this where you do an, an asynchronous request to the network, and there's a completion block getting called um, when it's done. But it's never simple, as simple as this, right? It's probably that you want to do something asynchronously on the background with the request and only then update the UI. And before you know it, it turns into something like this with three nested asynchronous callbacks. It kind of creeps, creeps up on you. So let me tell you what futures can do for you. You might have heard from, uh, about promises. Promises and futures, those terms are more or less used interchangeably. So if you have an asynchronous method called getImage, this method probably fetches an image from the network and has a completion handler that gives you the image. With futures, we will write it a little bit different. We still have the name that we pass as a parameter. But instead of passing a completion handler, we immediately return a future, a future with a UI image or an error. So if, if the operation is successful, you'll get an image. And if the operation fails, you get an error. And so the future is basically a placeholder for the value that, that you will get once the operation is complete. And this, with this placeholder, you can do a lot of things that you can do with the image itself. And that makes it really nice. So for example, we call the getImage method to get image of Swift. Um, and like completion handlers, what we could do is, is call on success on the future and give it a block that, that will get called as soon as the operation succeeds. But with, with futures, what you can do is add a second completion handler even. So 
uh, do something else with the image. Or add a third one that will only get called when the operation fails. So you separate the success case from your failure case. So let's briefly look into how you create a future, actually. Let's dive into the implementation of getImage. In getImage, I'm returning a future. I'm creating a future, and the initializer of the future is, uh, is passed a scope in which you can complete the future. So this scope is, is executed synchronously by the initializer, and inside that scope, I'm doing another um, asynchronous task, I'm, uh, asynchronous operation on a URL session, for example. And when that's done, I call the completion handler of the future inside that scope, and that will complete the future with, this, with the image. And when I complete the future, all the, the registered callbacks will get called. But you don't have to register callbacks immediately. You can also just store your future in a, in a safe place, in a constant, and use it later. For example, to combine it with the second future. Here, we have a second operation called getDetails, which will give you the details of Swift. Um, and here, I'm zipping them together, so you combine the image and uh, the details, which is a string. Um, and then we can, call, we can add a success handler on the whole thing, which will give us the image and the details. Or if something goes wrong, we get the error for either of the operations. So let's dive into get details. So for, say, for example, we want to display just like the first 30 characters of the details and then a read more call to action for the user. What we can do, we can use map, which transforms a future into a new future. In this case, what we're, we're doing is we're mapping the future that, that contains the whole details string into a future that only contains the first 30 characters of that string. And then we add a second map that will append dot, 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 read more. And then we save it, and the result is a future string. And this already is really powerful. And this is what you can do with the current version of Swift with a library like Bright Futures or Promise Kit. Um, and I really like it. But at the same time, it also adds quite some, some boilerplate code. Everything you're doing has to be inside these, this map. There's a lot of extra characters. So I, I'd like to, to, to experiment and see how we can take this a step further. With the current version of Swift, how we can, can make asynchronous values first-class citizens in Swift. So we continue with this example. And I'd like to get rid of the second map call. So I want to get rid of that plus operator. And what we can do is define an overload of the plus operator that works for a future string and a regular string. Implementation is quite simple. But when we have that in place, you can get rid of the second map. You can just write this. I also want to get rid of the first map, of course. And that, that, that requires a little bit more code. What we could do is we can write a, a protocol extension on the future that will only work for future strings. And we're basically adding the substring method to the future, which, of course, should return a future string in itself. And that will allow us to get rid of the first map as well. And this looks really elegant. But you have to write a lot of code. And I think you could, you could automate it. You, can, you could write something that generates all the, the operator overloaders, all the, all the, the methods on future uh, for specific future types, future strings, future images. But that would be a lot of code. So I think we, could need, we, we would need some help of the, com of the compiler of the language. And also, it's not very clear what, what would happen in this case. What happens if you want to set a future string on a label? So you cannot display a string on, on, on the screen that you don't have yet. Uh, maybe the compiler can help us. So w without any changes to the language, with just having a third-party future, we, 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 get, uh, we have a really powerful type. And I think we only need a little bit more to make it really nice to use. And that reminds me in some way of, of the optional. Because the optional, as it is defined in a standard library, is really nice and powerful. We, you could use it directly, but what makes it really nice is to have that, that syntactic sugar and the, some, some compiler special treatment by the compiler. That last 20% makes it awesome. So I, I, I would like to, to think about what, that, what, what the last 20% for the future would be to make it really awesome to use. And this is all Swift evolution mailing list material, um, the warning. So this is, this is what I, I'm thinking about now. So I, I, I'd say we need an async keyword in the language that, that we can use as a type modifier on, for example, a return type, indicating that in this case, the method is returning a future, an asynchronous type. And we can implement this, uh, this method um, 
in, in a way like this. So we have an, another asynchronous method, uh, fetch on, on a session, which will return an asynchronous data. And we pass that asynchronous NS data to the initializer of UI image. The compiler will automatically generate an asynchronous version of UI, the UI image initializer, which of course also have to, has to return an asynchronous UI image, which is the return type of get image. And if we want to do something with the image, set it and display it to the user in the interface, it could work something like this. So we call get image, and we put it in a constant. But then before we, we can display it to the user, we have to, to unwrap the future. And like if let, we could have something like when let. It's, uh, it, it's, it unwraps the future as soon as it's done. And inside the when let clause, you will be able to use the image value in a synchronous manner and set it on the, on the image view. And this is pretty, pretty directly mappable to using futures because that would look like this. And in addition to when let, if let might also be very useful that that will unwrap a future in that certain point in time just uh, or be nil if the future is not yet done. And probably we'll also need forced unwrapping because we feel adventurous from time to time. So I'm not a, I'm not a language designer or a compiler builder, so I'm not exactly sure if the 20% I'm mentioning is actually 20% of the work, it might be 50. Um, but to get a feeling of how, what kind of work we, that needs to be done, we can look at a proposal that became public when Swift was open source. There is a proposal in the Swift repository on GitHub by a Swift engineer, Nadav Rotem, and he's proposing a threat safety layer. And in this proposal, he proposes three components that make up that threat safety layer, because he says the only way we can do asynchronous programming in Swift is to do it in a safe way. Makes sense. So copyable, reentrant code, and gateway annotation. Copyable is a protocol that, that you can can make your types implement to indicate that they can be safely copied from one thread's memory to another thread's memory. Types like int and bool will adhere to the protocol by default, but you can also make your own types adhere to it. Reentrant code is code that only uses values and data that's, that's given to the code through parameters, so no access to global state that will allow the compiler to reason about all the memory that the code is using, making sure that everything is copyable. And the gateway annotation is something you annotate your method with when that method is spawning a new thread. So I, I made up a little example how that, how that could look. So here we have an async function that is annotated with the gateway annotation. It will launch a certain task with some arguments. In this case, I'm launching a Fibonacci algorithm with uh, argument 100. Um, the integer is copyable, so that's okay. Fibonacci only uses the values that you pass to it, no global state. At least mine doesn't use a lookup table or anything. Um, and then the async method has a gateway annotation indicating that a thread will be launched. And I think this looks really awesome. Safe, I would like it. I, actually, I feel like I don't want to write any asynchronous code anymore before this is out. So, so give, me, give me a call when Swift 4 is up. Or we could do this and, and try to make the best of the current version of Swift that we have and plan for a better Swift in the future. Thank you.